Australia's Uranium Opportunities by Keith Alder Recorded by Logan Smith with the permission of the Alder family. Chapter 19 The AAEC lost its way, or did it? In previous chapters, I outlined how the Commission undertook studies and projects, both locally and internationally, under a succession of governments and ministers, and how many of these activities were terminated without positive outcomes because of major shifts in government policy. All of these activities related directly to nuclear power or the nuclear fuel cycle, and it is because of what happened to them that the theory arose, mainly in the media, that the Commission lost its way. Because my thesis is that it did not, and accepting the risk of repetition, I think it worthwhile at this stage to summarise the policy shifts and resulting program changes in a reasonably chronological order. I do not know any parallel in the history of Australian science for what happened to the AAEC. Similar things happened to some extent in some overseas countries, for example in the USA. The United States Atomic Energy Commission was abolished and replaced by IRDA, the Energy Research and Development Agency, and soon after by the DOE, the Department of Energy, under President Carter, with very substantial reductions in its nuclear programs in favour of alternative energy schemes. So much so that the director of one of their major national laboratories told me somewhat cynically in 1980 that the funds available to him for any particular energy topic were indirectly proportional to the amount of energy it will produce by the end of the century. In other words, the more way out, the greater the funds. As a result, the USA appears to have lost the leading role it played over the first two decades in the development of commercial nuclear power. But the on-again, off-again nature of the changes endured by the AAEC in the period 1970 to 1983 has no parallel in the nuclear scene elsewhere. Our first major project to be abandoned was the Jarvis Bay Nuclear Power Station project. Unfortunately, we had already spent a considerable sum on preliminary work before the axe fell. But we did derive some benefit because of the condition imposed in our specification that the reactor had to be capable of operating on indigenous fuel. This opened up the whole secret area of uranium enrichment to international discussion and we were very active in this area for the next decade. First we had the Washington Talks of November 1971, but no positive actions resulted, certainly because interested participants concluded that the USA intended to retain detailed control of the technology and of the market, and therefore any offshore plant using US technology would not provide the alternative source of supply desired by the customers. The main benefit to Australia from that event was the opportunity for informal discussions with the French and with the European Chipartite company Urenco, and in both cases the result was a joint study of the prospects for an enrichment plant in Australia. The joint study with the French in 1982 resulted in a clear case for a plant in Australia. The French were very keen to proceed, but at the critical time the Australian government changed from the Liberal Country Party to Labour and the study was terminated for political reasons. This had been the first real opportunity for Australia to have an enrichment industry. At the time, the French were unpopular because of their nuclear explosive testing program. This unpopularity arose again, even more strongly, over 20 years later, over French tests at Muaroa and neighbouring atolls in 1995-6. It is interesting to contemplate whether Australia's influence as a full partner in a joint plan might have been great enough to prevent the tests and the resulting worldwide protests. After this study, Australia accepted an invitation to join ACE, the Association for Centrifuge Enrichment, formed at the initiative of Urenco. The invitation caught the new Labor Minister, Rex Connor, somewhat unprepared. Although he was very interested in uranium and its processing, as subsequent events proved, his policies were undeveloped and his advisers were uninformed, so there was doubt whether this matter was for industry or government. After a confusing start, the AAEC had the carriage of the study, but like the Washington talks, it did not lead to any firm proposals. 
A probable reason for the lack of interest by the minister in the results was his intention to arrange a bilateral study with Japan, which had been a member of ACE and known to be interested in possible supply of enrichment from Australia ever since the discussions with Alder and Miles in Tokyo in 1970. Also, by the time the ACE study ended, Mr Connor and his advisers were becoming involved in what came to be known as the Loans Affair, involving Mr Kemlani. This led to his political downfall and total inactivity in the proposed joint study with Japan until after the dismissal of the Labour government in 1975. The joint study with Japan was a success as far as it went, and the AAEC team was pleased to report a consensus report, which we understood to be unusual in such cases. But nothing in the way of firm proposals eventuated, probably because the Liberal Country Party government preferred the matter to be taken up by industry, and there were signs of this happening. In any case, there was no great enthusiasm exhibited by the Japanese to go further, as by this time they were well on the way to developing their own technology and had started building their first plant. Australian industry did pick up the initiative in 1978 with the formation of the Uranium Enrichment Group of Australia, UEGA, which undertook a successful preliminary feasibility study and went on to a full-scale study in 1981-3. Again, the results were positive, aided by the AAEC, the consortium concluded that partnership with Urenco would be attractive, and it intended to proceed with a view to establishing the industry based on Urenco technology and joint research involving the AAEC Centrifuge Enrichment Project Division. But then again Australia had a change of government, and the new Labour government refused to have anything to do with the government-to-government -government agreements that would be required to cover technology transfer and the new Labour government refused to have anything to do with the government-to-government -government agreements that would be required to cover technology transfer. This ended the second real opportunity for Australia to embark on an enrichment industry. But worse was to come, for the same government stopped all work in the AAEC on uranium fuel cycle topics and closed down the AAEC research on enrichment, which had been in progress for nearly two decades since 1965, at a cost approaching $100 million. The start-stop program changes within the AAEC were not restricted to uranium enrichment studies, though those were probably the most disastrous in terms of the national interest. Under the Connor Ministry, the AAEC was ordered to undertake all new exploration for uranium in the Northern Territory, to take charge of all Australian uranium sales, and to involve itself in the mining and extraction of uranium. To do this, it had to take on staff and undertake considerable expenditure, only to be told by the new Liberal Country Party government that it should cease these activities and hand them back to industry. How can they assert that we lost our way? The aims and objectives of the consortium in its uranium fuel cycle work, and particularly enrichment studies, were always directed towards the establishment of uranium processing industries in Australia, aimed at the export market. Thinking ahead, we visualised Australia as a major nuclear fuel supplier to the industrialised world. The potential of the industry was outlined by the Commission in its 19th Annual Report, 1970-71. We foresaw industries arising in series. Firstly, the conversion of uranium concentrate, yellow cake, to uranium hexafluoride, initially for export, but as soon as possible, for feed material to an Australian enrichment plant. But there could be even more. Fuel fabrication, ready for reactor use, and though difficult to envisage in today's political climate, even the possibility of reprocessing the spent fuel in Australia. We probably have some of the most favourable sites in the world for long-term storage and eventual disposal of nuclear wastes. But this is a controversial subject, subject to much misinformation and arousing of fear in the public arena, and therefore also political dynamite. There is one aspect, however, which could make the total fuel package not only sensible and profitable, but also politically less feared. This is the idea of supplying nuclear fuel to the users on a leasing fuel return basis. 
i.e. without transfer of ownership. The potential attraction is in the realm of international safeguards, the prevention of diversion of nuclear fuel or its fissile content to weapons use. Australia has taken a leading role in the application of safeguards, both bilateral and International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, to its exports of uranium, and it is conceivable that in the long-term future, a scheme of fuel leasing might be acceptable in Australia. Not, however, without considerable changes in political and public attitudes. We have already thrown away several opportunities to start these industries in Australia, in each case for reasons of political ideology. Dogma 1 over national interest. I believe that opportunities will come again as the role of nuclear power in the world expands. Its opponents do not believe this will happen, but I simply cannot see a practical alternative. But this takes us into matters of prediction and opinion. End of chapter 19 Australia's Uranium Opportunities by Keith Alder Recorded by Logan Smith, with the permission of the Alder family. Chapter 20 Australian Uranium, Where To Next? All of what I have written before I can claim to be fact. I repeat, I was there, and I did not get my information as others have done who have written about the AAEC from newspaper reports or selective interviewing. I have only been interviewed by one person interested in the history of the Commission, a professor of history, and nothing became of it, because, I believe, he didn't get the grant. The one book and numerous articles which fired me up to write this all relied on information collected years after the event, and, I'm afraid, mostly collected from what I regard as dubious sources. I think any potential interviewer gave me a wide berth because I'd never made any secret of my views and they certainly didn't fit those of the authors I've read to date. But in looking ahead at the possible future for Australian uranium, I am departing from fact, and so what appears hereafter is based purely on my own opinions. Many will find them unpalatable, particularly some of our current political representatives. To me, there is no doubt about two things which are essential ingredients in the equation. A. Australia has large reserves of economically recoverable uranium. B. There will be a growing market in the next century. I am not a geologist, though I did a limited amount of geology in my metallurgy degree course, which included also a lot of minerals processing, called ore dressing then. So I had some background in what we in the AAEC were doing in the Northern Territory in 1975 during the reign of Rex Connor. I found the results during our brief exploration program very exciting. As a result, I remain personally convinced that there is a lot more uranium to be found yet in the Northern Territory. Indeed, we may have only scratched the surface, literally, for all large-scale mining to date has been by open-cut methods, except a small amount to extract high-grade pitch blend by United Uranium NL in the late 1950s and early 60s at El Sharana, on the South Alligator River. But there has been little exploration at depth. We did a little, with promising results, enough to give the impression that the Alligator River region is an extremely promising area for further discoveries, if we don't lock it all up in such a way that exploration is forbidden. It is worth noting that the tremendously rich pockets of gold uranium ore mined earlier at El Shirana were in the area now known as Coronation Hill from which mining was prohibited by the Hawke government. My second assumption of the future of the uranium market is an opinion based on current facts, as follows. As of today, mid-1996, there are 433 nuclear power reactors operating in the world, with a total output of over 345,000 megawatts electrical. There are another 37 building or on order, and another 73 planned. Of those operating, 83 are in six of our neighbour countries to the north, Japan, China, Korea, Taiwan, India and Pakistan, about 19%. But of those on order or building, 15 of the 37 are in those countries, about 40%. And of those planned, 
48 are in these eastern countries, or about 67%. In other words, two-thirds of the currently planned nuclear power expansion is likely to be in our northern neighbours. And if we examine the records of planning versus what actually happens around the nuclear-powered nations, these countries have a record of actually doing what they plan, to a greater extent than most Western countries, with the exceptions being Canada and France. Although France did have a big reduction in planned capacity some years ago when the Mitterrand government was elected. So assuming this trend continues, and there is currently no reason to think that it will not, the major expansion of the market for uranium will be in this region. It is possible that the rate of industrialisation of all these countries may increase, particularly of China, and what will be their source of electrical energy. I believe they have already answered that question with their current and planned nuclear expansion programs. The present figures may turn out to be too low. An eminent international statesman, Harry Kissinger, recently pointed out that if the current rates of industrial expansion in China and India continue, world energy requirements will double between 1995 and 2020 to 30. We are constantly being told by some of our politicians that we are part of Asia and that our future lies in close ties with our Asian neighbours. There are major differences in religion and in some cases in attitudes to the individual citizen, but these seem to be swamped by trade considerations. However, where will these fast-developing neighbours of ours turn for their reactor fuel? There are several parts to this question. Firstly, for the raw material, yellow cake, and secondly, for processing to uranium hexafluoride and then enrichment, probably to about 2-3% uranium-235, and thirdly, for fuel element fabrication. At present, there is no shortage of raw uranium, and with the advent of genuine nuclear weapons disarmament, there is an unexpected large supply of highly enriched uranium and of plutonium from dismantled warheads. Let us hope it continues. Both materials can be downgraded to reactor fuel fissile concentrations, and this supply will restrict the rate of growth of the uranium market for some years. But already in 1996 it is growing, and soon after the turn of the century this trend will accelerate, with opportunities for Australian producers if they are allowed to pursue them. The recent Australian three mines only, really two only, policy of the Hawke-Keating Labor government has been a joke in the International Nuclear Club. What exactly did it achieve? Some saving of face? Some pacification of anti-nuclear voters who are pressure groups and therefore dangerous to politicians? And some small consolation to the mining industry, which could have been thankful it wasn't a total ban? Who benefited? Outstandingly, The Canadian mining companies, laughing all the way to the bank that Australian policy has enabled them to operate mines which probably would not have competed with ours if we did not have the restrictions. The most recent figures I have seen from the Uranium Information Centre, Melbourne, dated November 1995, show Australia to have 40% of the world's uranium resources and to be supplying 10% of the market, whereas the Canadian figures are the inverse – They have 10% of the resources, but 40% of the market. They must be very grateful to us. I recall vividly engaging in public debate with a senior ACTU official, which is something I finally gave up, as it is mostly useless arguing with non-technical anti-nuclear people. They have been fed a litany of lies, and they believe them. But I asked him, seriously, what do you really believe is wrong with uranium and nuclear power? The answer? They are contrary to ACTU policy. Do you wonder that our uranium policy was regarded as a joke? However, we did have it, but hopefully it is now behind us and the industry will be able to develop further mines, subject of course to modern environmental criteria and controls, under which the recent mining of uranium has had an excellent record. Starting new mines or increasing the capacity of existing ones is not going to be easy. Any such proposal immediately arouses criticism and protest in Australia. There is much support for the policy to leave it in the ground. This attitude and the Three Minds policy have not been the only barriers to the use of our bountiful resources. We as a nation have been steadily locking them up, 
by means of Aboriginal land rights, national parks and heritage areas, so much so that exploration for uranium has become a rare occupation. There is not a lot of justification for companies to go exploring when the market is weak, and where it is difficult to get approval because of these factors. But unfortunately, this means there is little or no opposition to these anti-exploration and anti-mining moves, so they are implemented without any outcry. And by the time we should be going ahead to discover and develop further, it may almost be impossible to do so. Again, this is an area in which the public is being manipulated with misinformation by anti-uranium lobbies. For example, any television coverage of a uranium matter in the Northern Territory invariably involves the showing of beautiful pictures of the wetlands in Kakadu National Park, whereas often the site being discussed is hundreds of kilometres from that area. This happened repeatedly during the arguments about Coronation Hill. Those who have mined uranium in the Alligator Rivers area, where the wetlands are located, have done so responsibly and with no degradation in their surrounding environment. And the actual area they use in the operations is minuscule compared with the total of the park and wilderness area where we are all, including the mining companies, so keen to protect. I can recall flying into the Narbalek mine area at the height of its activity, deep in Arnhem Land, and the pilot of the light aircraft pointing out the difficulty of locating us unless you really know where to look from the air. One wondered what all the fuss was about. The uranium debate is likely to go on for some time in Australia. We have no pressing need for nuclear power. We thought it would come during the 1970s and 80s, but it did not, and now it seems further off than ever. Unless Australia gets hammered internationally over air pollution from burning coal. There is some evidence already that our developing neighbours do not believe we are pulling our weight in reducing emissions of greenhouse gases. Questions of this nature will arise increasingly questions of this nature will arise increasingly when the present generation of large coal burning stations has to be replaced. They don't last forever. This same factor, the need for replacement of obsolete and worn out plants in other countries, is another reason why I personally expect the uranium market to improve more than is currently predicted. And I have recently met some young members of Greenpeace who admit they may have been wrong to oppose nuclear power. They are becoming aware of the atmospheric pollution effects of coal-fired stations, including the greenhouse effect, acid rain and smog. One had been to China and did not see the sun in midsummer for weeks. And the other had visited the Black Forest in Germany, being poisoned by atmospheric pollution. But neither of these people will admit publicly what they believe privately. For the present, Australia is a comfortable place in which to be anti-nuclear. We don't need the nuclear power, and we therefore don't need to mine and sell uranium, except to make money. The world's anti-nuclear organisations have continually taken advantage of these circumstances, and I am sure they realised long ago the potential effectiveness of anti-nuclear propaganda here to slow down the long-term development of nuclear power. I have been told this, proudly, as clever strategic planning by some of their members. I feel we may be making a serious long-term problem for our descendants with our current policies and attitudes, and our complacency regarding them. We should not forget that a major cause of Japan's entry into World War II was the fear of losing supplies of resources, in particular, fuel. Looking ahead, all of the Asian countries expanding their nuclear programs that I outlined earlier will need increasing supplies of uranium. They all know we have it, in large quantities. If we continue to say no to exploration and mining, and the world supply becomes scarce or expensive, what do you think their attitude will be? I am not pointing the finger at anyone in particular, just pointing out that if we don't take advantage of our resources, someone else may come and do it for us. And who will stop them? None of the administrators of heritage areas, parks and wildlife areas, or Aboriginal reserves. I simply do not like the prospect of over 2 billion people, about half the world's population, living to our north, utilising nuclear power and wanting fuel for it, and looking south at more than a third of the world's resources lying undeveloped in a relatively empty country. Perhaps these are alarmist views, 
but they should be considered as part of the equation to mine or to leave it in the ground. Having said that, I hope when, not if, we do adopt a sensible uranium policy, we look again at upgrading the product of mining in Australia. We have thrown away one opportunity after another over the past two decades, but the opportunities will remain if we take advantage of our main bargaining point, the uranium resources. But it will need major shifts in political policies, acquiring a great deal of courage by whatever government is in power, and also a major campaign of public education to overcome the decades of lies and misinformation to which our population has been exposed. Possibly the hardest part will be to educate our teachers. Unfortunately, the attitude to nuclear energy by the teaching fraternity is, on average, hopelessly biased against us. We need to convince them that although nuclear power has its dangers, in the long term they pose far less of a hazard to the earth than does the current dependence on fossil fuels, which we should be conserving for future use as raw materials for multitudes of other uses. And we should encourage our teachers to look realistically at the alternative and renewable energy resources such as solar, wind, tidal power schemes. These are very important and useful contributors, but quantitatively not alternatives for large-scale baseload electricity generation. In other words, we should encourage the educators to think quantitatively about energy supply, to do the arithmetic and to teach the children likewise. Sooner or later, I suppose those children will have a disillusioned awakening, like my young Greenpeace friends. If we do ever do get these political and public relations and public education problems solved, there is no doubt in my mind that the opportunities will be there for Australia to establish a series of major industrial enterprises based on uranium, initially for export earning, with total nuclear fuel cycle services, including reprocessing and waste disposal. The consequences? Jobs, major contributions to our balance of payments, and considerable benefits in control of nuclear materials to prevent proliferation of their military uses. It will be nice if we really do become the clever country. End of chapter 20 And end of Australia's Uranium Opportunities